Health Tech Connect is a program sponsored by the University of Arizona. What Health Tech Connect can do is match the innovation that the entrepreneurs are bringing in with the needs of the healthcare organizations. We can create more companies, grow those companies, and create new jobs and opportunities. When you connect the funding, the education system, and the customer base all together with the entrepreneur, that's a really powerful way to accelerate innovation within the ecosystem. It's a hotbed for opportunity. We want to cultivate the growth and exchange of ideas. We're really moving into a whole new era here. Research can be applied today to the creation of services that can be successful in the marketplace. We all at the end of the day are working towards the same goal of improving healthcare. With Health Tech Connect, we can make a very powerful place for healthcare innovation together. president for health sciences at the University of Arizona. And it's, I mean, you can't beat Friday afternoons, right? This is, this is one of the best. And whether you're in person or attending virtually, and we have a number of people signed up virtually from around, actually, we got some references even from Europe who are going to be joining us. So uh, thank you for attending. Uh, we're all here on the beautiful Phoenix Biomedical Campus. Uh, for the second gathering of health technology entrepreneurs, healthcare organization, government entities, funders, economic development organizations, and of course, researchers and other faculty from the University of Arizona and its educational, sister educational institutions. A couple of years ago, we began thinking about an initiative to advance healthcare technology in Arizona, and we purposely chose Phoenix to be the center of the activity. Uh, today is our second. As I mentioned, Health Tech Connect, and for that, there are a number of people to thank, specifically from UAHS Communications, Jerry Kelly and Kathy Kudrafi. I have, thank you very much. And then certainly for the organizational aspects of all of this, uh, Carolyn Berger and uh, Anne-Marie Medina from down in Tucson who's come up to help. It's no secret that the University of Arizona Health Sciences has built a strong foundation in Tucson since we were founded in 1967 as an expansion of the university and where four of our colleges and a dozen health sciences programs and centers are based. What you might not know is that four other colleges in addition to the College of Medicine Phoenix are located here in Phoenix. Nursing, pharmacy and public health colleges have a growing presence here and in Gilbert. We recognize that Phoenix and the surrounding area is vibrant, exciting, and a place where we want to invest our time and resources in 2022. We're gonna be launching a number of additional centers and programs that take advantage of this growing relationship we have here in Phoenix and extend our reach to improve health and well being. Health Tech Connect is certainly a pivotal part of our programming and represents a truly meaningful way that inventions and ideas to improve healthcare and healthcare experiences can move from concept to commercialization, reaching patients and other healthcare consumers. As you are no doubt aware, the fastest growing group around the world and here in Arizona are those individuals 65 years of age and older. The challenge we face as healthcare professionals and as a society is how they help these people live their best lives as they age. That's the goal of one of our top initiatives at the University of Arizona innovations for healthy aging, and you heard some about that from Kathy earlier, which is also the focus of this Health Tech Connect meeting. Innovations in healthy aging provides the perfect opportunity for bringing together education, research, and technology to improve health and wellness. The initiative goals are to create environments that encourage physical activity, healthy nutrition, social interaction, and engagement and to promote independence and self-management by leveraging technology while providing physical, emotional, and cognitive support. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear our present presenters today who represent a range of healthcare technology 
activity and ingenuity in tackling the grand challenge of optimizing healthcare across the lifespan. Again, thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy Health Tech Connect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dake. Good afternoon, everyone. And what a wonderful way to spend a Friday together. It's so good to see all of you here and also those of you who are joining us virtually. I'm Caroline Berger, Director of Corporate and Community Relations for Health Sciences here in Phoenix. And again, I'd like to recognize my colleague here, Anne-Marie Medina, who is our director in Phoenix is here as well. We also have another group of individuals that I want to recognize as well, and those are our executive faculty committee members. These are individuals, if you want to advance our slide, I'm oh, sorry, thank you. These are individuals, some are here and some are also presenting today, who have made their commitment and their dedication to Health Tech Connect. They are our advisors and they're helping to serve as program consultants as we go forward. So we truly recognize and appreciate their dedication to the biotechnology community here in the Phoenix marketplace. So, as Dr. Dake said, we have a very exciting and hopefully very engaging afternoon for you, and we encourage you, if you have questions for our presenters, to be able to speak up. Um, for you in person, we have a microphone on stand here in, in the middle of the room, but also feel free to raise your hand because the, mic the room does have microphones throughout, so if you speak loudly enough, we'll be able to hear you. For those of you in the virtual world, Anne-Marie is, is your host, and please feel free to submit questions and comments comments and feedback in the chat function. So without further ado, I am very honored to introduce our first presenter, who is also our sponsor for Health Tech Connect. And she is representing our innovations in healthy aging. And please welcome Tara Sklar. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. I love this. It's like a little director's Sure. And um, it's always funny to see a giant photo of you. And I was telling um, our organizers that I haven't had highlights since pre-COVID. So <laughs> a reminder of how long ago that was. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm with the College of Law and, uh, and I am really honored to get to work with uh, U of A Health Sciences in different ways with innovations in healthy aging. And I also um, am an I, uh, advisor for the telehealth law and policy with our Arizona telemedicine program at the College of Medicine in Tucson. And, and a lot of what I've been doing for several years in my research is really looking at how we can safely age in place uh, with tech and long-term care. So it was this natural bridge to have this presentation today with you all here uh, between Health Tech Connect and the innovations in healthy aging. I am a lawyer, so I have to have a disclosure. This is not legal advice. However, we have a number of fantastic uh, College of Law alumni who I'm sure would be happy to speak with you and provide legal advice if that is of interest. And I'd like to just acknowledge a colleague of mine here in the room, Professor Keith Swisher, and he's based here in Phoenix, where we have a, a growing law program as well. And some, some exciting um, work happening here in Phoenix with his leadership. Uh, so the other thing that I try to do, and I think is a, an important part of what we're building at the U of A, is working outside of our discipline. So while I'm in law, my co-author and colleague is Dr. Katherine Huber. She is an alum of University of, of, of the uh, College of Medicine down in Tucson. Now she's at University of Colorado in Denver, a resident there, an aspiring geriatrician. And we've been working on topics related to vulnerability and technology and long-term care for a while. And we presented to you know, community talks at Dignity Health and the Ivy Brain Tumor Center here in Phoenix. We've done this great initiative out of the UA Health Sciences with Tech Talk Tuesday. And a lot of this idea of working outside your discipline uh, with colleagues at the university, students, other researchers, is really what uh, Dr. Insel was describing with the innovations in healthy aging. So this is the website, which I am blocking, <laughs> but you know, it's healthyaging.arizona.edu. And I, all the things that Dr. Insel said earlier about ways we'd like to engage with you are up there on, oh, thank you, up there on the website. And, uh, and there are over 90 researchers that work in aging at the University of Arizona. And 
eager to collaborate on grants. Um, we're having a number of events at the end of January, uh, so save the date for January 27th for our launch and January 28th for a uh, workshop, research workshop, really thinking about the living lab, the built environment and how we can optimally age as we get older in, in place. Um, so there's a call for proposals. If you have particular ways that you'd like to connect, I really encourage you to connect with us. So uh, now to, I guess, more of my talk for the moment is what's been happening with long-term care, uh, you know, right now, and it was, we're still going through COVID and um, people's changes in perception about how they view, review, uh, want to receive it. So even before COVID, there was a preference to age in place, to not go to a nursing home to receive care. But um, this, this has really exploded since COVID, where people absolutely want to receive care in the home. There are articles all the time in business outlet journals like Wall Street Journal and Forbes, really emphasizing the preference to age in place. And, and at the key of that is technology. Um, in fact, one study that came out of the University, University of Chicago just recently was now it's as low as 2% of Americans want to go to a nursing home facility to age. The vast majority want to explore more ways that they can age in place. So the issue with that is we're not there yet, right? The biggest payer for long-term care is Medicaid. And if you qualify for Medicaid, uh, then you do have the option to go to a nursing home. But many, as we've as you've just seen, and as you probably know and is intuitive, would rather age in place. So they have another part, states have a number of home and community-based services um, waivers that you can sign up to if you don't wanna to go to a nursing home and you do qualify for Medicaid. But the wait lists are, it's striking the statistics. So nearly 820,000 older adults um, are waiting to receive care for Medicaid to stay in the home across 41 states. The average wait time is three years. These are folks that could go to a nursing home, but they want to stay in their homes and they're just waiting. Um, and these are folks that, you know, have the so limited assets that qualify for Medicaid that there are many millions of Americans who are not in that situation. And we're probably all very familiar with the scenario of how to care for our loved ones. Um, it's, it's just an ongoing struggle. So there's a real opportunity for technology to step in, given the workforce shortages, given these wait lists on how it could help Americans safely age in place. And that's what we've seen a huge explosion of, especially uh, during COVID, of what's happening um, in data-driven healthcare in the home. Everything that you're probably familiar with, the, the diagnostics and monitoring. In fact, I just heard today, well, I mean, I've known about this, but basically how Alexa could be one way to diagnose whether you might have um, Alzheimer's and other ways that apps and devices that record our whereabouts, our, our, everything about us um, uh, are monitoring us and could increasingly be used for uh, healthcare in, in different ways for diagnostics, monitoring, tracking, um, uh, biometric data. So, but what hasn't increased, even though the, the technology has, are these guardrails. And that's really where the law and policy steps in, where people haven't necessarily consented to have their data be tracked in, in ways that's tracking their voices, their gait, their um, heart rate, and, and how that would have an impact on how much of their data they would like to be shared and what would happen to it. So while we have all these great promises, with um, improving efficiencies that we desperately need, as you just saw those numbers with the wait list. Um, you know, there's also the real issue of how to adopt technology in such a way that we're really honoring autonomy, that we're um, helping accessibility, and um, but through through technology. So um, my co-author and I have identified um, some of the things to think about as we're adopting technology specifically to help support um, aging in place. And some of the things that we've highlighted is that there is going to be heightened vulnerability. So of those, let's say those who are qualified for Medicare, age 65 and older, you know, um, two, uh, on, on average, two thirds of those beneficiaries have uh, two or more chronic conditions that they're managing. And 15% of Medicare beneficiaries have six or more chronic conditions that they're trying to manage. So it's definitely a population that has multiple comorbidities that we're adapting this technology for. And then along with that, you know, how do you get legitimate 
meaningful consent. If you these like, you know, click through small font menus are not really describing to someone what exactly what about their data is being collected? How is it being used? What if they want to turn off some of these devices? Really engaging them into a meaningful consent process. Another fear with technology is we're already having staffing issues. So what does this mean as technology gets adopted in the home in terms of increasing um, the risk of social isolation and loneliness? And then lastly, um, the you know, quality of care. So one argument is, and I believe in this argument, well, you could have more meaningful connections with staffing where instead of someone, an aide collecting vitals, the apps and tech, technology can do that. They can actually um, have a deeper connection, but that doesn't happen automatically. That's something that has to be built into the adoption with tech is that type of training and expectation. So one way to begin doing that is through Medicaid because Medicaid is the biggest payer for long-term care and they have a vested interest in trying to um, help this population. So I did a study a few years back, pre-COVID, on like, well, what is happening with Medicaid, which is um, as care shifts into the home from an institutional setting, um, how are they managing it? How is it, what does the oversight look like? And what I found with my co-author is um, it actually is, all over the place because different states manage it in different ways. And the one I just wanna draw attention to is quality assurance. So in the sample of states we looked at from across the country, you know, different red and blue political affiliations, in some states there was no oversight. Like someone could be receiving long-term care in the home and maybe they'll get a call every now and then uh, just making sure that with a, with a check-in, like, are you okay? Are you receiving care? And that's it. Whereas other states, Nevada being the more robust one in this sample we did, they um, actually had um, an inspector like go out to the, the home and check on the beneficiary and make sure that he or she was doing all right. They were receiving their care. It was an on-site inspection and they had an annual survey at the end. And that was by far the most active of the diff what different states were doing in this area as we shift from providing care more, in more into home and community as opposed to the institutional setting. But there's very little consistency. And I think this is a real opportunity for how tech could step in where you would have command centers of sorts where you can much better monitor the health and well being of someone who's trying to age in place. But in order to do that, you need to have some standards and, and, um, and that is also all over the place. A lot of these um, different devices and apps are considered wellness types devices. So they don't have really any real oversight from the Food and Drug Administration, or as I just mentioned with Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. And the other issue is there's a lot of disparities in accessibility. So we already know that 21 million Americans don't have access to broadband. Um, so as these technologies roll out, what does that mean in terms of the digital divide and people who might be most in need of receiving this type of care having access to it? Uh, in terms of digital health literacy, what do we know about how they are obtaining and able to process and understand the different technology that there um, is now being uh, that they're now using or, if, and, or would like to use. And so a lot of that can involve this inclusive design. We really involve older adults, um, you know, testing the devices, making sure it's something that, you know, they can read, they know how to input their data, you know, really having uh, able to use it. And that's something that I think we can really help with at the Innovations in Healthy Aging are those types of studies. So just to put that out there. Um, and I think it's important that we do this sooner than later because what's also happening very quickly is the private entrepreneur side with very, very large companies entering how to provide care in the home, um, including Amazon, Walmart, Best Buy, a slew of um, startup companies looking at how to do this. And I think part of the reason this is also happening is because of what's happened with telehealth, where pre-COVID, it was very difficult. There were a lot of restrictions around telehealth, around out-of-state uh, providers practicing in different states around how reimbursement would work, um, where how you could do it. You had to be at certain originating sites to you know, connect to your provider. And so that's all changed um, you know, during COVID and 37 states have now enacted what were public, part of their public health emergency waivers to become legislation in their state. Of course, that has 
variations across the country, depending on the state. But in Arizona, I'm actually so impressed, and maybe those of you in the room are well aware of this, of HB 2454. I think it is the most robust, amazing telehealth law I've seen to date. It addresses all those issues I just named with licensing for out-of-state providers, reimbursement is par on parity, uh, whether it's um, via telehealth or in person, and also you can access it from your home. So I think we have a real uh, opportunity here in Arizona with this flexibility. Um, and when you do provide care in the home to be able to have that access um, to a provider with telehealth. And uh, just, just an update nationwide, what it looks like, because um, there was a huge spike with telehealth growth right when COVID hit, as we all might expect. And like, what's gonna happen? Well, we, who knows what's happening now <laughs> with variants coming, but it seems to be holding steady at about 38 times um, people act, utilization of telehealth now from you know pre-COVID. So just to kind of sum up where we are with what we've been presenting as technologies adopted more in the home is the idea that there is this huge healthcare need and there's market demand, the devices are coming, the laws in many ways are relaxing. So how can we really help maintain that autonomy, uh, uh, sorry, that autonomy, increase accessibility, and, um, and what particularly can we do here in Arizona? I, I wanna also just bring up one other point when we're kind of being more forward looking with this technology is that, that human connection side. So one of the big pieces with long haul COVID and older adults that have been social isolating because they're so concerned about infection and are getting reinfected is, you know, even as technology is being adopted, how can we help ensure that there is still a human connection? Uh, so I'll begin to wrap, wrap up, but um, I just wanna emphasize that, you know, as, as very much with, with this whole event is about Health Tech Connect and innovations in healthy aging, we wanna use this technology in such a way that it, it enhances how we age and ways in which to do that are some you know, proper consistent oversight from the government regulators, um, including some standards in terms of how to make this technology culturally and linguistically appropriate. Uh, there's opportunities with vendors to really engage older adults and what their preferences are regarding how they can obtain meaningful consent, um, what will happen with their data, their privacy preferences. There's, a, I, I think, an opportunity on our part as a university to look at some of those digital health literacy issues and providing real educational support. And, and lastly, I, it's just an issue that we're also impacted by. We all may be struggling with it ourselves or know someone who is about how to help people um, receive long-term care in a way that they can from their home. And, and there are lots of ways to do that with clinical trials and advocacy. So I wanna thank you for your time and um, I am happy to answer any questions. I'm happy for you to reach out to me about any of this research, um, innovations in healthy aging, um, any of our programs at the College of Law that look at these issues. So maybe I'll, that was kind of a lot, maybe I'll pause <laughs> and um, before I introduce our next speaker. Oh, yeah, so go ahead. Oh. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Um, I if you feel free to email me, but then also uh, it will be posted somewhere or sent out to all the people that register to the event. Yeah, thank you for that. Very. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. That's a great question. <laughs> Other great questions are also welcome. <laughs> I think the data supports social isolation. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
can receive more staffing in that regard. Maybe if they're recovering from, maybe, or maybe if they've been diagnosed with long haul COVID, um, ways to help address that uh, with staffing, tar more targeted staffing. Um, I think we all, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I, I, you know, clearly there has to be some way in which um, we can't just say technology will will fix it when we know that this is already a risk for older adults. And uh, so that's what I'm really trying to flag with some of this research. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead, sir. Do you see the law changing much with big tech getting into you know measuring me through things like Alexa and Siri and listening into the home? Do you see a lot of change at the national level? long-term? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, so basically, what, what might be happening with legislation or maybe regulation or even guidance in terms of as tech is more incorporated, incorporated within long-term care, um, how it might be regulated, uh, particularly with some of these wellness type apps, like and I, I wouldn't even call Alexa a wellness app. I don't know what you would call that. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, the FDA now has an office of digital health. So they're actively trying to provide guidance and look at these issues that um, of focusing it from a user perspective. Uh, so I think before we get into any kind of legislation, it will be much more um, about regulators providing guidance and really uh, getting feedback from companies providing the tools and apps and technology and then user feedback. I think that I can see centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and especially even a lot of the providers under Medicare Advantage taking a more active role in how to deliver that technology going forward. Um, more than I see the FDA getting too into it, but, but uh, it's a great, great question. It's an area that I think we're all sort of struggling with because we welcome the, the device, but we know that they're, um, we're aware of possible risks. We can take one more question, and I have a microphone if someone has a question so our virtual audience can hear. Any questions? There be, oh, go ahead, Dr. Dick. I'm just curious from, uh, from the legal perspective, which I think uh, you probably are best positioned to answer. Uh, what sort of standards exist now for home health care providers in terms of documentation hand off to other providers that might lead to authorization of payment for this type of work oh wow huh well we, thank you and I, everyone can hear that so that was i won't re, i won't repeat the question but uh the handoff is said is such a critical step that i think the technology could be very helpful with it's very time consuming it can leave room for error uh, there's studies being done on how to use technology specifically to help reduce the time it takes with handoff. So in terms of incorporating it with reimbursement, um, with home health care, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, well, generally that would be um, someone's paying by the hour for that type of service. So it would be, yeah. It seems like an opportunity. Right. If we want to make sure that the standards are set in a way that the mm. government, the payer, whoever thinks that this is, you know, working, yeah, yeah. How are we going to be able to but ensure it, a uniform you know, documentation okay. such that when the next person comes, you know, it's right. done in a way that right. might be quantified. Right. And it seems like there's a huge opportunity to sort of address that. Yeah. Address yeah. That. Yeah. I agree. And I think. <laughs> It would also very, be very helpful because one of the the hesitation, right, is for a company to invest in doing this without knowing where reimbursement be there. So why bother be, there's, what's the incentive to be proactive in making sure there is this high quality transfer of care being provided? Yeah, I, yeah. I, exactly. I think that many companies would be hesitant without that assuredness right. that it's gonna end up somewhere. Right. But for someone like with your yeah. background, and, right. Working on setting standards is the necessary step that could, just like with sure. telehealth, you know, is how that's worked out. Yeah, I, yeah, opportunity. It's a great point, and um, everybody, 
I think everyone seems to have hopefully caught the, uh, so it is a great opportunity. Uh, the most innovative work happening with it is really through these pilot programs. So maybe it could happen through that with me watching Medicare Advantage really closely. Medicare generally doesn't pay for long-term care, but the, some of the Advantage plans are looking more at it because they know they can save money in the long run by having someone not go into a nursing facility after they have a fall. How do we stop that from happening? So I can see that being an incentive and innovation to try to incorporate um, the reimbursement more proactively. Yeah. Anyway, so clearly it's a very fluid area. <laughs> what I think, what I think, what I love about today's talk is the presenter right after me is going to be talking about care in place. And uh, I'll maybe I'll go ahead and introduce her now. Her uh, name is uh, Dr. Janet Frank. Wang Warveda, and she is with engineering. Uh, she's a professor in electrical and computing engineering and also biomedical engineering. And, uh, and I believe her talk is on how to embrace digital health. So oh, there you are. Hello, Dr. Warveda. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Okay, hi, thank you. Um, Actually, all the questions that you guys asked, actually, I don't know how to answer them yet. So today, I'm just uh, bringing in the um, technology perspective and um, hopefully can uh, establish some discussions with uh, various uh, experts in this uh, meeting. Um, so um, we just have a new NSF IUCRC center. This is called a Center to Stream Healthcare in Place, or you call it C2SHIP. This is a multi-site UA lead um, site, uh, center. And um, we have other uh, sites uh, at the Baylor College of Medicine, USC, and the Caltech. And we have an upcoming new member at the University of Missouri. Um, so you've heard a lot about um, uh, the policy and the legal perspective. And um, so what we are looking at is more on the device and the algorithm and uh, how we handle the data. Um, so if you look at this figure here uh, from left to right, traditional way of deliver care. And now this is the new way, care in place. And of course, this is a decentralized uh, care model. And um, so, in order to establish that, what we can do is using the cutting edge AI and machine learning plus existing sensors and systems to uh, establish uh, real time data processing, diagnosis and tracking and including also some um, intervention to establish digital uh, therapy. So this is also very important when we hand out the sensors and the systems, considering phone, uh, mobile phone uh, right now is very popular. And we also believe that this has a high potential of um, solve or solve partially the health disparity issues and establish health equity. A wide range of applications uh, will be covered including chronic illness care and maintaining independence, um, such as aging in place. And of course, it's not always about the sick care, it's also about prevention and uh, people's well-being. So let me give you one example. So this initiative is actually $3 million. Uh, we already received the NSF's, um, their grant. And at the same time, it also, um, 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 well, matched by the industrial members. Uh, right now, we have uh, 23 members that uh, joined our phase one proposal submission, and uh, 21 of them actually signed a, a letter of financial commitment. Okay. And then um, let me just briefly introduce um, using Diabetes Foot as one example and how the, each site work together. So as an example here, uh, Caltech, for example, uh, they have a um, expertise in nanomaterial, micromaterial design uh, that includes in this case is dressing bandage, gel antibacteria for uh, diabetes foot. And in the middle, um, UA and together with other experts, we work on sensors and the system design. For example, um, put the sensors inside the socks and the inside insoles. So you have um, smart socks and a smart insole 
and collect the uh, wear bearing, uh, the load bearing on the foot. As we all know, when people have ulcer on their foot, they lost the sensations. And sometimes the patient may put too much pressure uh, on their wound, okay? And then we also have uh, Baylor College of Medicine and USC who actually specialized in doing the chronic disease uh, management, okay? So it's like, um, this, this is where the traditional telemedicine come into the picture and you have real time in person people uh, from the remotely guide the patient to do some of the exercise and um, manage the illness. So these are the companies, um, but we welcome any different size of companies and why Situship the Center is different from other incubator or accelerator that you're looking at. That's because we do have uh, inside of the Situship Center, we currently do have an innovation program uh, coaching uh, the, the small business as well. And uh, we collaborate with NSF's, um, um, their iCorp, um, that multiple iCorp nodes actually try to provide initial fund. And we also provide a clinical trial design and execution, and then with top notch of researchers and building teams to facilitate different size of companies with their different needs. And of course, uh, we do partnership with NIH and NSF fund. Uh, so in terms of our contribution to the community, um, if you look at the left hand side is traditional uh, hospitals and um, the facilities doing the testing and here right hand side is at home. So we're looking at just um, providing this connections between the traditional hospital and with the people's place uh, at their home or their workplace. So our project categorized, we start from design stream data. We also take care of data and doing data mining. And a very important item is prototyping, testing, and the design as well. And one of the important aspects about center is from the center, uh, the industrial members and organizations can reach out, not just uh, the researchers, but also the hospitals currently connected with the center's researchers. Um, so we're looking at a 20 million, uh, for example, patient that can encounter in the middle, this is a, a Texas area, all the hospitals over here, they have one square mile, many hospitals. And, and then, but we also have Phoenix area, Mayo Clinics and um, Bana and Tucson area, and also in the other area, in, because we have researchers um, in some of the other state and then wherever they are, and we reach out to their hospitals as well. Uh, we're not only looking at just the sensor, sensors and systems that uh, for home use, but we try to bring it into a much extended and balanced health system, or we can call it creating a learning health system. Here, um, the care in place or the center really is right here, but we also established the research collaborations with cancer um, um, experts and, um, and the public health experts. And we try to bring this into a much bigger system and hopefully um, using mobile sensors to collect enough data. So let me walk through a couple of uh, existing um, projects that we have. Uh, our strategy is head to toe. As you can see here, um, we're looking at the wearables, but we also looking at some of the repurposed uh, sensors. For example, depth sensor, bed sensor, and motion sensors. And using the sensors, these are non-wearable sensors, but they can be used together with wearable devices and then augmented with AI and the machine learning algorithms to establish a framework. And we can equip people living uh, by themselves to establish a um, aging in place uh, framework. This is a real example. This is our faculty member at the center, uh, Dr. Marge Skrupik, and this is uh, her parents. And we already have this uh, framework established. Okay. So people worry about uh, the sensor data um, security. Um, sometimes they don't want to have their identity revealed. In this particular case, uh, even though it's called a depth camera, but it is really 
does not reveal people's uh, face at all. As you can see here, we can easily monitor a patient's uh, movement and find out whether they had a fall and how they fall and whether there's a follow-up check needed or not. Okay, so in this particular case, this one particular patient actually fall and uh, unfortunately hit his head on the counter. And then we did a follow-up check and then everything went on well. And we also look at the new devices. Um, this is a really just published uh, in Nature this um, August um, 2021. And the leading um, institute is actually Caltech because they developed a smart chain mail, okay? And then looking at the previously, the smart wearables, or we call a smart robot, this is a hovered previous um, generations uh, of the, um, uh, the smart wearable or smart robot. As you can see, in order to combine the sensors together with this material, you actually have to carry a lot of equipment. Today, this is just the one piece. Everything is all on here. Sensors together with the fabric. We call it fabric. Of course, you can have a bigger or miniature, it depends on your design. And this fabric can enhance people's muscle and considering there are some people that um, because they're frailty, they may fall. And then by putting this on established real-time feedback, and uh, we know also through OpenSIM developed by Stanford, understand that which part, how their walking gesture is, even how their hand movement are, or their back. So just putting this uh, fabric, you can also call it smart robot onto their body to enhance certain part of their muscle. This is another project, uh, neurological disorder with intervention. And this is done by various of experts actually at the UA and um, uh, built upon some of the existing uh, result from MIT and Harvard. So from left to right, uh, this is a using just a bio patch using heart rate variability to understand people's stress level and try to do intervention using um, this um, a, a breathing, different breathing exercise. In the middle, this is a 3D printed uh, skull. And then we put uh, some gel material, mimic a brain um, a gray material, and then to understand how the intervention can be uh, achieved um, through this feedback loop. This is our own student that doing the testing. So we all know that um, normally when you have this different type of, uh, uh, for example, current, um, try to stimulate inside of the brain, it's not easy because um, the, um, the skull and some of the material can absorb majority of it. So here, when we're doing this, what happened is we're using our um, frequency modulation and then add it onto some additional high frequency and try to carry the waveform that's a useful waveform intervention into the deep temporal area. Other collaboration that carried us into another dimension, we all know that how important the visualization is. So this is a project work together with Caltech again, they are CD3 um, that designing specialized into the user interface. Here, as you can see that by designing different the color, we actually using this heart, okay? Uh, try to give people the understanding about whether their behavior is good or not. For example, uh, breakfast, um, smoking, bad behavior, exercising, good behavior. And these heart, very easy design, but very vivid and people can see, can be displayed on smart glasses and the Fitbit. And then we're using flexible, actually, the, um, the microprocessors. Another project, well, um, we also established a training, um, not just uh, for the medical um, doctors and the nurses, but also for K-12. This is an ongoing uh, project that uh, sponsored by NSF before. And we worked together with Catalina Foothill District and then establishing real-time sleep education and together with the training. And this is exactly the cancer tracking project. Um, I'm, if you're interested, we can talk about after this um, um, meeting. 
And uh, another thing I would like to point out, um, the health equity is very, very important. Working together with USC, we have been establishing a social structure related um, um, understanding how the risk factors is with the different uh, social equities and institutional equities, living conditions, and what kind of behavior we may have, what kind of uh, disease we may have. And of course, as you can see in the middle, uh, we established that monitoring and data collection just by using um, um, this uh, Fitbit and together with their phone and iPad. Thank you so much. Um, this is a pretty much my presentation. And I also send out a, um, our meeting flyer because our annual meeting is upcoming in uh, December 16th um, in uh, Caltech. And we do have a hybrid mode and then welcome everybody to join us. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Janet, who also serves on our Health Tech Connect Executive Faculty Committee? So thank you, Janet, for your time today and also your service. Any questions, any online questions? Yes, we do have one here. Janet, the question is, where is the data published? Data? Uh, published, okay, so uh, there are a couple of uh, different type of data. For the research data, normally we publish them into conference paper or journal paper. Um, is, is this the question where the data published? <laughs> If someone would like to get involved in the research, who should they contact? Uh, they can directly send me email. To you? Okay. Yeah. Very good. We'll share her contact information again. Yes, another question. Uh, I'm curious, like, you know, have you noticed that it really works? Like, bed alarms, do they work? Uh, again, you know, like the same, similar along the similar lines, you know, where the data is coming for that. And then um, there was a camera shown in the next slide, which um, showed a figure of how patient ended up falling. So mm -hmm. it seems like for fall monitoring, okay, but then what is there to prevent a fall? You know? Um, Prevent a fall is a good question. Now for the data, uh, we do have a couple of database. If you are interested, I, I can talk with Marge and we can share some of the data and showing you both a bed a sensor and bed sensor is basically uh, a accelerometer. Uh, so, um, and then the depth camera, we also have data. Now pre prevent fall is unfortunately still pretty tough. Um, I think it, it's, um, so far, there are quite a bit of a research that uh, they can say that, okay, this people is frail, but it's still very difficult to say, hey, in the next five minutes that you're going to fall, that I think it's still is a little bit difficult, but sometimes they can, based on their gesture, they can say that, okay, this people is falling. But if you want to prevent it ahead of time, it's still a little bit difficult. Yeah. We have another question here. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I enjoyed um, all the different examples you gave. I, I thought it was really interesting how you brought up the, the issue with identity um, in terms of one of the cameras being shown and a sensitivity about that. And from what, some of my own research, I know that that stems from the feeling that someone could be caught in a way where they could lose control over um, their, where they currently are, be forced to move or have more oversight than maybe he or she may like. So I was wondering how you navigate that in this space when there's a lot of fear about being watched in, you know, with those cameras and um, what some of those consequences might be if someone feels like they you know, could be caught demonstrating that they might have some early onset dementia um, with those repercussions would be how you deal with that. Thank you. So 
that's a very good question. Um, so I, I can only say that what we have done, okay? So one of the things, the, uh, the depth cameras image was processed by some um, image recognition AI program. Um, and then some part of the data is sorted out by that AI program. So people basically, it, we point back, reference back to some of the, the raw actually um, sensor and saying that this is the location where the event may happen. So what that happened is um, then it's going to be singled out and sent to the doctor's office. Okay, so having said that, um, there are a couple of locations here. First of all, when we do this, we did not really uh, stream all the data into a outside external server. Uh, we basically load up a um, desktop with programs, put it into people's home. So they process that locally. And then, so when there is a paragraph or um, a, a certain portions of clips of that um, raw data need to be sent to the doctor's office, that's the part that will be sent to the doctor office. So in some ways that um, handling data locally or we call it the edge computing, handle it locally. I still believe that it's much safer than you stream all the data into somewhere else to um, do the process. And of course, the another question uh, that you asked is uh, how people feel comfortable. Um, I think uh, I, I talk with a couple of people that are doing uh, the interview with a lot of um, um, elderly. Um, almost immediately when you tell them that, hey, I need to install a camera in your home, the first reaction is no, you, you can't do that. Even though you call, tell them that this is depth camera, they don't like that word camera. But then if you show them what exactly the data shows through the depth camera, they realize it is really not going to reveal their face at all. So later on, they actually feel comfortable with that. Okay, thank you very much. One of the um, wonderful privileges that we have in offering Health Tech Connect is be able to shine a spotlight on local entrepreneurs who are doing so much good in our community in the business world. And I am delighted to introduce you to Scarlett Spring, who is the co-founder and CEO of Taproot Ella. Scarlett also sits on our Health Sciences Phoenix Community Council, and she has been a trusted community partner and advisor for health sciences here for several years. So we're just honored to have her here today and to be able to introduce you to her as well. Scarlett? Thank you. Thank you so much. So Taproot Interventions and Solutions, we're the creator of Ella. And Ella is the first personalized care management platform that is designed for caregivers caring for persons with cognitive deficits. We are focused on Alzheimer's, dementia, and mental illness. However, the same platform can be used in autism. As a matter of fact, we've actually been talking with Denise Resnick around how do we support that particular patient population and the caregivers. Being designed specifically, Ella elevates the caregiver to minimize the risk of high life-threatening events that sometimes happen in this patient population. Now, you're gonna see in this presentation a word called behaviors, but let me be clear. Our philosophy at Taproot is we believe their reactions to a caregiver who is trying to provide care to someone who has uh, dementia, Alzheimer's. So just right up front, I'd like to disclaim that because we do feel strongly that sometimes um, a caregiver will inadvertently frighten or cause a high risk event to happen. And that's what we're trying to do as well, is to educate that caregiver. Now, like many, maybe many of you in this room, I've been impacted by Alzheimer's and dementia. I've had an aunt, a grandmother and an uncle who were all diagnosed uh, with early stage dementia in their mid 60s. And maybe many of you have been in that same situation, but we're not alone. There's you know, over 10 million Americans that have somehow been impacted by 
uh, dementia related disease and or mental health. And what we all want is just when we have to make that decision around what kind of support for our loved one, that they're getting personalized care. So at Taproot, we developed Ella for the frontline caregiver. We're really asking frontline caregiver to do a lot. In any given day in an assisted living or nursing home facility, a caregiver might see someone who is exit seeking, who is experiencing some delusion, or who is absolutely just quote unquote, you know, having a bad day, maybe refusing showers, maybe refusing eating. And so what we want to try to do is provide that caregiver with tailored solutions to de-escalate those behaviors so that we can provide the best care possible. So that's exactly why we developed um, um, Ella. These, these behaviors that are happening in these uh, caregiver uh, uh, facilities, they're ever changing. And what we want to do is to try to help minimize those distress and then provide some customized care. Sorry. So what we're looking to do, we're far more advanced than a static patient record. We put on the hand of a caregiver the ability to observe a behavior. You press on that behavior and you get three to five customized solutions to be able to de-escalate that moment. We also want to improve that continuity of care because when you're in a long-term care facility, there is a high turnover ratio that's happening now with quote unquote professional caregivers. It's upwards, it's always been in the neighborhood, I say always, at least the past five to seven years in the area of 65%. During the COVID, it was as high as 94%. And so we'll just say somewhere around 75% turnover is happening. I actually am not aware of a care facility here in the state of Arizona that is not using a temporary agency to backfill or pull from their other units because we've been so impacted by COVID and trying to provide this. Ella enables temporary agencies who show up on day one to know exactly in this particular unit what behaviors uh, an individual has uh, been displaying and what kinds of solutions have been working to calm that patient so that they're getting the best experience and overall health comes uh, available. As I mentioned, it's, we want to keep this super simple for a caregiver. They're very, very busy. These individuals are getting paid maybe $15 an hour. Perhaps English isn't a first language. So we're really asking them to do a lot with very little resources. You pull up an individual's name, you are able to right there see what is the behaviors that are frequently uh, by that particular individual. You get an idea of a solution. And we also have a favorites page. So if it says redirect with a favorite snack, you now can go to Mr. Jones and know that he actually uh, prefers to, uh, to have you know, cheese whiz or something is his favorite snack. And he wants to talk to, he, to talk to you about University of Arizona football or the Cardinals, because that's what is something that's very tailored and personal to him. Our whole intent, and, and this is a particular example that is real. So someone is experiencing short-term memory loss, they're being challenged um, and they're trying to leave. It's so common, and this happens with uh, even in professional caregivers, that they go up and they try to talk them out of, no, Ms. Jones, you're actually fine. You're in a care facility. Rather than just simply saying, tell you what, your flight is delayed. How about let's go grab a coffee until your flight is ready? Many times that individual, that distraction, now you've de-escalated that event and they're able to move on with, that, with their day. Seems simple, but this mistake is happening all over the country at this very moment. Our intent is to be training our algorithms in long-term care facilities, assisted living, as well as nursing, because this is a tool that's really needed for the home caregiver. But we want a validated tool. So we upload our information with very personal and detailed information that comes from the family member. We also acknowledge what are the behaviors, and just for Alzheimer's and dementia, there's 25 
most common uh, behaviors. And our algorithm is now looking through to find that perfect match. So when that particular event happens, uh, someone is refusing a shower, someone is refusing to eat, you now have an idea of how to uh, enable uh, the best care possible. We're currently in 11 units, five different facilities here in the state of Arizona. Um, we have got a very high um, uh, feedback from caregivers. We're constantly talking to, the, talking to them about how do we make this application easy? And we developed something called a family update feature that is a direct link back to the family member so that they very quickly uh, can get information about, is their family member being uh, well hydrated? Are they eating? Are they taking their meds? And 100% of individuals said they uh, value, uh, valued getting that and wanted to continue to get that kind of report. And 92% said it would make a difference of a placement decision of where they would put their loved one. I mentioned to you that today we call Ella the assisted version, because what we're trying to do is take some things that are manual and automate them through a digital application. As we train our algorithms this year and be able to give back the reporting and the outcomes measures, were we able to decrease those behaviors, the, the intensity of the behavior? Is that individual able to stay and in, in age in place longer? That sort of data we will be getting, we call that the augmented version, all with the idea of us having the autonomous version so that we can actually be a part of the component that you're seeing today is that home solution so that individuals can age at home longer. It's an important year for us this year. We believe by middle of this year, we'll have over 200,000 data points to be able to inform our algorithms so that uh, toward the end of the year, we're doing all of our validation. I won't bore you with this slide, but what that really means is uh, going into 2023, we really believe that not only we can serve this Alzheimer dementia consumer population, but also now look at some of the aspirations that we have in other areas. So we're very care center, uh, caregiver centric with a bias toward providing a real action. It's a unique and validated resource um, uh, of this what intervention, solution, and what's the outcome measure of that. And of course, we are very integrated because uh, it's a family member component. We wanna wrap in that caregiver and the family member in uh, our Ella solution. So with that, I'm happy to answer any of the questions that you have. Thank you. I'm a little, a little actively involved here today. Uh, I just, I love the caregiver centric approach and I'm wondering, especially given our location, is this also available in Spanish or other languages? Absolutely. So that's one of the things we want to do and, and actually other languages as well. But yes, we are looking to convert into um, uh, Spanish is going to be our first one, but we're also looking at some, so, uh, strangely enough, Russian was actually one of the ones that we uh, had a caregiver. It's not uncommon for someone to revert back to their native language. And therefore we had to develop kind of cue cards for some of our caregivers uh, so that they could interpret and back to um, in Russian for some of the uh, residents. Oh, that, that's actually the, the second part of my question was the training that you provide for the caregivers. Um, uh, I, I work with a number of different caregivers that are immigrant workers in long-term care. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how they would receive training, you know, and also make sure they understand how the app could work. Quick clarifying question. Is that training on how to use Ella? Because we have built actually an academy within Ella mm -hmm. and we have made all of our trainings no longer than nine minutes. Some of them are very 30 seconds to a minute and a half to three minutes because we believe the caregiver needs to take care of themselves as well. So sometimes it's about how are you caring for yourself? But then it's also educational components about just dementia, Alzheimer itself. So we built an academy that's very integrated, uh, not a didactic kind of a program. Um, so what, just clarifying question, which one were you asking? Oh, well, actually, that's a very helpful answer. So it's not a once-off, here it is, but it's an ongoing, yeah. I think you, you, 
As far as just the mobile application, the care, you can download this from uh, Google as well as um, the Apple Store. So our app is available. Now, the, because uh, we are HIPAA compliant, no information sits on this app and you have to have a two-factor authentication to be able to use it, but the Ella app is available today. So Scarlett, I saw this was in institutions. Are you looking at a home healthcare model rollout as well? Correct. Right. And okay. that's why, thanks Ben for the question. That's why, uh, I was trying to go backwards. Uh, oops, I'm so sorry, I'm messing up your slides now. Uh, that's why I, I, I talked about the development of the algorithms. We're using a raffle shot to develop our algorithms in long-term care communities, but our aspiration has always had a consumer tool. We're going to use home health care because we have got home health care that's really asking for uh, this tool to also train some of the behaviors. For instance, um, your loved one trying to drive is just one that you hear all the time. How do, what do I do? How do I, how do I keep my, my parent from getting the keys and driving? You see, you wouldn't find that, obviously, in a facility. And so there are a few of those that are very tailored to the consumer. Was there any requ uh, regulatory requirement? It's very interesting. We are and and we are offering two to three solutions. Um, it's not one size, and there's no guarantee. I mean, this is this is a high risk population that is going to have behaviors. But what we're trying to do is using your personal background information to provide that solution. Is it increases the odds that that solution is going to work. And that's what we're trying to do. So to answer the question, there aren't regulatory guidelines because we're not a diagnostic. We are not just giving one answer for one behavior. We're giving at least two to three because if that first one doesn't work, we wanna know it. As a matter of fact, that's why we're in facilities is because it might be that your caregiver prefers to have a male versus female or that just some caregivers are better because at the end of the day, the caregiver is the intervention. That individual has a cognitive, um, uh, has a cognitive issue. They, it's not really something they could control. So the caregiver is the intervention. And we try to provide at least a two or three solutions. How do you validate outcomes? Yeah, that's what we're doing right now. So uh, when a caregiver has an intervention, we already know, that's why uh, every caregiver, we, we went out and did lots of beta testing, but they all actually wanted it on their cell phone. We have the ability to put it on some sort of uh, other mobile application that is within the care community, but they wanted it on their phone. So we're gonna be able to know which caregiver, they simply select, uh, you know, Ben, you know, it's Ben, Ben's behavior is refusing showers, Here's some suggestions on how to de-escalate that situation. And you tell us, did it work? Did it not work? So we're validating, you know, that intervention against that particular time with that particular um, caregiver. And did it work? Did it not? Correct. Is there a database that you're able to compare your outcomes with? Well, don't have Mm-hmm. They're actually, so well, we've known, and, and I apologize, maybe I'm not answering your question. We've known that behavioral interventions do minimize high-risk behaviors. I mean, that, that public, those publications are out there. If you went to the Alzheimer's and dementia website today, it would say, you know, play soft music or redirect with a favorite food. What we're really trying to do is very much tailor that to that intervention it, the favorite food is X, the intervention is Y for that particular person. So the validation that we're trying to do is to um, try to get it as person-centered as possible for that particular individual. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you so thank much. You I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. No, no, it's wonderful. I okay. appreciate it. All right, we'd like to continue on with our organization spotlight, and um, we would like to now introduce you to STC Health. Oops, sorry, Unfortunately, Mike could not join us today, um, but we have someone who is stepping in in his place. So welcome, and please introduce yourself, and um, thank you for being here. 
Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. Uh, good to be here with you guys. Yeah, I'm not Mike Popovich. Um, I'm Luke Harris. Mike got uh, called out uh, to see a client today, so I just got the presentation and um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so STC Health, we're just on the south side of town here, not too far at all. We're in the warehouse district. Um, it is a 30-year-old company. Yeah, here we go. Sorry, yep, 33 years, 33 year old company. Uh, we're focusing on vaccination reporting. Um, so, probably in the last month or so, you've heard about vaccinations um, in, more in the last month than you did pre COVID, uh, probably for your entire life. Uh, so, we now know it's, it's uh, prevalent, uh, it's here to stay. Uh, but vaccine reporting is something we've been doing for 33 years. Uh, we run the Arizona uh, registry. So if you got vaccinated here in Arizona, um, your data would have flowed through our system and we um, manage the Department of Health uh, Immunization Registry. And so we run about 25% of those vaccination registries in the nation. Um, and we also, our technology is in 75% um, of the pharmacies across the country. So uh, looking at COVID, I think there's a, a number here. Uh, so there's 160 million immunization events uh, that are flowing through our system. So uh, we are in every state. Um, uh, COVID has certainly advanced um, uh, the amount of data that's flowing through our system. Um, and like I said, approximately 75% of COVID vaccinations through, uh, flowed through our systems. Uh, so far in the in the uh, pandemic response, um, are you are you able to hit that link? Let's see if this works. It's a fun little toy that one of our developers made. So this is vaccinations happening right now. Uh, so anything that's flowing upwards is a is a vaccination that's uh, going from a, a pharmacy into um, a state registry, tells you which state it's going. The purple ones are COVID vaccinations. Uh, so you can see most people are getting COVID shots today. Anything that's flowing downwards is a shot that uh, is, a, sorry, a record that is coming um, from our system uh, back to a provider. So if you need to go in for your second COVID shot, the provider would, would check your record to see if you've already had the second. We can also forecast if someone needs their, their booster shot, uh, if they meet the requirements. So the, the vaccinations that are flowing downwards are um, part of how we close gaps in care. So there, there may be people that haven't finished their um, vaccination um, a course, like had all the shots required. Uh, so the provider can then see this person is missing uh, this shot and they can make sure that people are up to date. Okay. Uh, and then so um, you probably just remember vaccinations were always just a childhood thing, you know, something to make sure we no longer have polio or measles. Uh, things like that, or if you're a parent, you may have needed to get your kids vaccinated and, and had those records. Uh, but vaccinations are um, and now more from birth to life, uh, not just with COVID, um, but for things like pneumonia and shingles and uh, flu shots and things like that. So once was a just a, um, a, a registry where we held a few vaccinations or immunizations, now we hold many. Um, so between the ages of 50 to 70, you may now get um, up to 29 uh, different immunizations in that age period. Um, so uh, that's kind of how uh, things have changed a little bit. Um, another thing that we do is that you can get your vaccination record uh, on your mobile phone. If you here got your vaccinations in Arizona, um, we have a, um, a site uh, called My, My IR Mobile, it stands for My Immunization Record, My IR Mobile. Um, and we have over 2 million people um, have gone to that um, uh, site to be able to have their, their vaccination record so they can travel um, or they can show their, their vaccination status um, to get into a country or get into an event. 
so that's all I had for you guys today. Is there any questions? Okay. Yeah, so the, the, the visual of vaccinations going up and down was just something that uh, one of our developers wanted to do as like a pet project. So he coded that website um, just to show the amount of the uh, data that's flowing from the system. But the use, so it's not really used for anything, but just to see that there's a lot of people getting vaccinated across the country. Yeah, yeah, and that comes back into the the mission of the company is um, technology solutions to eradicate preventable disease uh, through vaccinations. Yeah, so uh, the question was, uh, is it public sector or private sector? And it's uh, now both. Uh, so traditionally, it was just the state health departments so or government agencies um, that were running vac vaccination programs. Uh, it's, um, about seven years ago, when Walmart started to do a lot more vaccinations than uh, through uh, uh, like a primary uh, uh, health provider, um, we started to integrate with all the pharmacies in the country. So Walmart, Walgreens, CVS. If you get a vaccination there, it flows through our system. Um, and now it's becoming more um, integrating with uh, technology providers. So different telehealth solutions, um, different app uh, providers like Clear um, and things like that. So it's across running across the, the gamut. Uh, yeah, so interoperability is a big part of it. So how we connect and talk to other systems, we are we are doing that with um, different apps or different uh, telehealth solutions. Um, so that's probably where the expansion is going to be, but it's still going to be in in vaccinations. Uh, so yes and no. I mean, there, there are other, there are, um, so um, a year ago, we're now, from a year ago, we're now, um, there's probably 10 to 15 times the amount of data that's flowing through our system. So we're a software company, but all of that hosting is through, you know, cloud providers and they charge you on the amount of data you have coming in and out. Uh, so costs have increased exponentially. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, a lot of people didn't even know about vaccination, uh, immunization registries or systems, unless you had to get your kid's record. So I guess my real question was, uh, you take like a penny or two off everything that gets uploaded from the no, we, we have a contract with, with a pharmacy, yeah. So it, it would just be, no, it's not volume-based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you for jumping in at the last minute. We certainly appreciate that. And now we are going to take a little break. Um, we do have some chips and some water and, and some goodies back there. So please feel free to indulge. And we'd like to have um, in person, have everyone back um, in the room for the rest of our programming by about 2.40. So take about a 10 minute break, um, stretch your legs. Thank you.
it. So if you could come and take your seat. Okay, well, that was very, thank you, everyone. Very attentive, wonderful group. You can all come back. Uh, it is really my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Nabil Dib. He has a list of credentials, as you can see right behind me. Um, and the one that is not there that I'd like to talk about is he's also a professor of practice in law at Arizona Law. He teaches in our regulatory science program, a class every summer on uh, a, a translational, translational pathways for medical devices. And what I, I also wanna emphasize about Dr. Dibb is he really believes in creating this educational ecosystem that goes beyond uh, medicine and law and business and engineering and really brings everybody together with through, throughout these different disciplines and then connects them directly to leaders in industry and regulators around the world. And he's just an absolute pleasure to work with and I'm so delighted he could be with us today. Thank you uh, so much, Tara, and thank you, Caroline, uh, for the invitation. I'm truly excited to be here because I, I think uh, and a long time ago, I thought this is, should have been way earlier happened, 20 years ago, because we definitely need that. There's no question in my mind. This picture, it looks exciting and much younger. That's a 20 years ago. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is the same person whom you saw in the pictures talking now. Uh, I want to emphasize on uh, three points. I want to make my talk uh, short, it's 10 minutes like what it is, but I want to emphasize on three points. Number one, the platform or the, or the infrastructure that we need for medical device development that it truly we do not have. And number two, I'm going to introduce you on the infrastructure that we put together over the last 15 years. And now it's coming into fruition. Most of the work was done over the last four years. And then I'm going to give you an example how that infrastructures can affect the way that we invent and to translate a concept to a useful product. All of us excited about innovation. Innovation is what propel us from being a cave dweller to a space explorer. And we'll continue to do sort of so. Nothing more exciting that a new concept and innovation, especially for the people who's obviously in this room. Because of innovation, our life uh, uh, expectancy increased over the last 65 years by 25 years. You can imagine uh, people lived in, in the 1800, their lifespan was 29 years. In 1950, it become approximately 50 years and now, we live about 78 years. All that because of the innovation, there's nothing more important than this mission. So the medical device innovation currently, we definitely have inefficient ecosystem for innovation. There's no question and no argument. 15 years it take to develop a product on average and another 10 years to adapt it to become useful for patients. It cost us for a drug development $2.3 billion now to develop a drug and cost us for devices on average, the PMA device about $1 billion. Just contrast that to the coronavirus vaccine timeline. They do have the right infrastructure. We can do things faster and much cheaper if we know the path of innovation. And uh, because of that, in the beginning, I want to just uh, uh, highlight some difference. There's a difference between invention and innovation. Invention, most of the scientists would think that life exposure, experience and exposure will provide the raw material. And when we encounter unmet need or a problem, and we would like to uh, solve them, then our brain redesign that raw material and to find the solution. That's what invention 
And that's usually how the concept come. And there's many, many examples that you see here uh, in this symbol slide. The bottom line is everyone can be an innovator, inventors. Anyone can be inventors and everyone can have many ideas. Ideas actually is easy to have. The issues is the difficulty come, how you translate an idea to useful product. And that is very complex process. That is very complex process. And that's why it take too long, too long to bring a concept to become a useful product that in the end of the day is going to help the patients. So as you see, this is a truly unmet educational need. And I do believe university should focus heavily on a unique programs for every student because every student can be inventors. There's no question about that. Every student can be inventors. The question is how can they take that concept to the final line? As you see, if you look at this slide, this is a very complex process. You need to know the unmet need, which is meaning I need to understand a lot. If you're a doctor, a lot about the disease itself to know what's the unmet need. You need to see, you will bring multiple concepts. Everybody will tell you concept how to solve for one problem. You can have hundreds of concepts, but you need to know which concept can be manufactured correctly. You can have IP on it. You can develop a business plans and fundraising for it. It can pass the regulatory pathways. It can pass the regulatory strategy. It can be adapted by physician. And finally, patient wanted it. You can imagine, you need to think of all that all in the same time. That's a difference. You need to think about all that from the day one when you choose that concept. You can imagine this educational difficulty, how, how, diff uh, how different is that from what we teach a student today? We teach them in medical school and we focus on how to use a product. They already have the drug, they already have the device, and we teach them, okay, this is the right patient that you can develop. They've never been involved in how you develop product, how complex it is, how is the data, the data generated first in man study or phase three clinical trials? They don't understand very well, actually, the statistics behind it. Uh, and, uh, and that's lead to, as you see here, if you don't understand all this, then become complex when you have a concept and you don't have a platform to follow. It has become very difficult. Where do I bring the money from? Whom should I talk to to protect my IP? Oh, I didn't know that there's FDA that need to control everything. Myself is, was one of them. Uh, so, so all this is, is a critical information. And uh, interesting, actually, I think this type of education is lack in all our educational system across the board. And there's no one platform where everybody can go to, uh, uh, to learn. So because of the system we have today, one out of 3,000 idea and less than 10% of a startup will succeed. And that's published data by uh, John Hopkins from Dr. Uh, Yazdi. So the bottom line today, really, I want to emphasize not going, of course, over every single step and what, how to approach it, but just want to emphasize how complex is the process and what we are missing in our educational system. And uh, so the, because of that, actually I, I can't tell you little stories. In 2000, I, uh, I was very excited like that pictures that you saw a few minutes ago. Uh, 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 graduated from Harvard, I was a Boston University, Tufts University, Harvard University, great educator. And then I went to Harvard School of Public Health and I did uh, you know, epidemiology degree and a study a lot about, about the statistics and so forth. Came here to, to Arizona Heart Institute and started to do first in man stem cell transplant, first in the United States. And uh, I was uh, talking in, Washington, uh, in a meeting in Washington DC, giving a talk about, I'm going to do next month four patients with stem cell transplant because I brought a basic scientist from Duke at that time was Doris Taylor. And I told her, I have a lot of skill from interventional cardiology. 
And uh, I told her, I can do everything in a 3D and I can deliver everything you want while the patient uh, awake. Oh, she said, oh, no way. I said, yeah, I brought her here and I did animal study and I has a lot of experience in animal, which is part actually of the translational pathway to understand the animal model and the difference between animal and a human. And how can you apply a device or therapy in, 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 in animal and how can you take it to human? You have to have similar model. Is it heart attack model? Is it heart failure model and so forth? So I did that. And when I was in Washington DC, I was giving a talk that I'm going to do four patients with stem cell transplant, the first in the US. And uh, after the lecture is done, somebody came and introduced himself, say, hi, how are you? I'm uh, Richard McFarland. Uh, did you say you were going to do four patients with stem cell transplant? I said, oh yeah, by the way, here's my card. If you want to see them, you are very welcome. He said, oh no, no, I'm uh, the director of the toxicology study at the FDA. I never saw you, uh, you send me <laughs> IND. <laughs> And I said, what IND stand for? <laughs> Investigation on new drug application. I have no idea despite all that education. Then I really get kind of a little bit upset and, uh, and depressed with all that education that I did not know what IND is. So I started a, a society called the International Society for Cardiovascular Translational Research. And uh, the society is dedicated to expand the education on medical product development, uh, as you see here. And I have over 100 experts. Uh, I was a speaker worldwide, and I knew many of the people who have the knowledge in this from academia, from industry, from regulatory, a reimbursement agency, practice guideline committees, and patients, actually, incorporate patients. And uh, I raised about $4 million to put infra educational infrastructure for medical device development. And that was over the last only four years. Uh, before we hold annual meeting with ACC and, and many other society to educate on translational medicine. But then I said, that's not going to be enough. We, know that we need a uh, very well-known infrastructure and we need to incorporate it to university for a student to know. So that I was able to convince the FDA, uh, Dr. Dake might know Bram Zuckerman from the FDA on our governing board. I have Alan Kribier on the governing board, uh, some of the innovators, Spencer King on the governing board from educators also and, and experts and so forth. So we have, and, and we brought industry, every chief medical officer from industry joined the board. And we have also international scientific board total 26 uh, people from the board and 36 scientific advisory board. We have Tara as one of them on the scientific advisory board. But we brought 100 experts uh, in the field and four years together I support with $4 million. As a result of four years, we have now online educational course for medical product development and that's general for everyone, not necessarily cardiovascular. My expertise, cardiologist, obviously I want to do cardiology, I know how to do that. But we did a first a general, and that general information deal with 36 lectures online with a question answer, and will deal with uh, the, how you choose the right concept, uh, the uh, intellectual property, like what I said, business of planning, uh, the uh, preclinical evaluation, manufacturing requirements, uh, pivotal trials, I'm sorry, the uh, first in man studies and early feasibility studies, we follow obviously the regulatory uh, requirements and uh, the, the uh, phase three clinical trial or regulatory reimbursement and the uh, strategy and adoption of technology. So those are the key. And then cardiovascular online courses specific for cardiovascular devices. So if you are developing stent for coronary artery, uh, ventricular assist device for heart failure, catheter for arrhythmias, and so forth. Those are very specific. 80 lectures uh, online from the world-renowned experts in the area, in every area, and then a question answer with them. And we also, I ask them to write ebook. Every paragraph of those ebook, four people at least have to be on that paragraph. One scientist, one regulatory, one from industry, and one reimbursement agency. So that language is all connected. It's not one person saying his opinion, more kind of consensus 
among all these uh, uh, people together. And we have another A book in, in cardiovascular translation of medicine in general, which is not only devices, but devices, biologics, and the wow. drugs. And uh, establish, I founded the journal also of the uh, translational, uh, cardiovascular translational research in 2008. It's published by Springer Nature uh, by monthly. It's become very successful worldwide. So that all that educational material now exists in one place. So people want to be involved in that. In addition to that, we do webinar. Um, as you see here, now we collaborated the first university, actually college, is a college of law here, James Roger College of Law, University of Arizona, and we started the first course. And thanks, the dean is here uh, today. Thank you for coming. Uh, and, and we are going to continue with that course with the help of the energetic Tara. Everybody know Tara. And uh, obviously, we're expanding it to other medical schools and, and, and engineering schools and so forth. Uh, we have uh, another 50 to, uh, 35 students from Bordeaux last year. They registered again to take the material. They are going to be used supplement to their curriculum. In the University of uh, Arizona here, College of Law, we give it, they give it a three credit. We modify it a little bit, and it is on their own system and go to their own students. So for anybody here, really, if you wanted to know, uh, you know very well, if you're interested in medical device development, uh, you can register for the course that Tara uh, and I, we are, we are doing in the College of Law. Uh, it, it is unique. In addition to the course, we are supporting the course with the world renowned and expert in every area. So we have, uh, Tara said, we needed a, a talk from innovators and we have uh, John Simpson. Uh, I think Dr. Dick knows who's John Simpson. He gave a great lecture to the students. We have over a hundred attendees and they firsthand, they exposed you know, the, the, all the challenges that he passes through. We have innovated many of the medical devices that we use today in patients. In addition to that, we have another one also with the University of Arizona um, about uh, the business uh, uh, planning. And the Stan Rowe was uh, the lead uh, business uh, person for the tavern uh, that probably all of you know is delivering the aortic valve with the catheter. Uh, in addition to that, obviously, we, we hold uh, you know annual meeting with many uh, um, uh, societies and, and conferences meeting like PCT is very well known European Society of Cardiology. Uh, and we address multiple issues and, and met need and, and where we are going to go from there. So I think that knowledge uh, for, for the future will make a huge difference. And I'm going to give you just an example after one know the pathway. This is a catheter that I developed for localized drug uh, delivery and biologic delivery for intra-arterial system. Just to show you the complexity of the catheter and how short the time that it took and how little the money that it took to make it happen to, to patient. Uh, this is the... Uh, the catheter, just uh, notice the complexity of it. Uh, I think it has sound on it too. A guide catheter is introduced into the femoral artery, navigating through the aorta and across the aortic arch, accessing the main coronary ostium. A flexible guide wire is introduced through the catheter into the artery and is advanced towards the distal end of the vessel. The ND infusion catheter is introduced over the guide wire and is positioned within the intended segment under fluoroscopy. The balloon accommodates a variety of vessel diameters through its ability to expand up to 4.5 millimeters, thus reducing the need for multiple catheters for different patients. The balloon controls blood flow, helping to localize the physician-specified agent into the targeted area during infusion. The agent is introduced into the catheter and moves through the system towards the catheter tip. The expansion chamber regulates the flow velocity before the agent enters the multiple lumens, potentially decreasing the likelihood of catheter occlusion. The physician-specified agent is dispersed through the multiple channels at the distal end of the catheter. The spray mechanism leads to better mixing with the blood and potentially better tissue distribution. The ND infusion catheter's balloon is uniquely designed to reduce radial forces, potentially minimizing vascular trauma. The balloon is deflated, 
the catheter is retrieved and the guide wire and guide catheter are withdrawn. So uh, as you see, these catheters, it took uh, uh, now FDA approved and have CE mark approval. But the time, if you know the, the pathways very well, the time it took to get FDA approval, uh, two years and five months. And the CE mark approval, which is in the same time we applied. So both of them were obtained with less than the three years time period from the concept. And uh, here's obviously what the material you see extensive. And this is a number of patents that the catheter all were in the same time it obtained from, you know, worldwide. And the key is to have the right team. I think the right team is a critical in this. From day one, after the concept identify, we have a lawyer for intellectual property. We have the engineer. We have the regulatory for the FDA, regulatory for CE Mark project manager and manufacturing facility. And we meet every Wednesday, every week, one hour, and everybody exchange what their, their information and, and moving forward. So everything adjusted in the same time. If we modify anything in the catheter and the lumen, the regulatory person know about it already, make sure it's is, is, uh, compatible with the, uh, the predicate device. So it's not different and so forth. The IP lawyer would know about it to write a different IP or ex expand the, the, the portfolio of IP. So I think where are we going right now? We completed the translational pathway for device development. And in the very near future, we're going to develop one for a drug and one for biologics. And if we do that for cardiovascular, since my expertise in cardiovascular, but I think that will be the example to be applied in any other area. The similar way will be for neurology, oncology, respiratory, because the difference only the endpoints, whether we are looking for stroke versus looking for heart attack versus looking for other things. So the platform will be the same. The clinical trial design endpoint would be a little bit different. That's really the difference. And if we achieve that and have it in universities, I think that's what's going to make a difference in the end of the day for patients. I'm very confident that if we do that in the next uh, 10 years and expand that science, I think the curve that Eugene Brown will draw about the, the reduction in mortality with the advancement of the science will be much steeper. And uh, I hope that you can uh, also join the society. It's a great, great team, extremely uh, organized and expert uh, people. And I think together with meeting like this and adding all our thought together, no question in my mind, we can pave the way uh, for medical product uh, development. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Nib. Very thank nice. You, and thank you for also representing one of our community partners, Dignity Health. Oh, thank you. Yes. Okay, we're going to move along, and we would like to introduce our next presenter, who is Richard Austin, and he's joining us from Tucson today, so we appreciate Richard you coming up. He is the CEO of Reglaging. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Austin. I'm the CEO at Reglagene. And uh, this afternoon, I'm charged with talking about what it's like to be this, a startup CEO, the triumphs and the failures that one goes, goes through. In, in putting this together, I really want to speak to people that you have a technology and you're thinking about starting a company or you're thinking about tossing in with the startup or knowing a lot of you in the room today, you advise people that are about to go in into startups. And so that's really who I wanna to talk to this afternoon. I wanna focus on just two topics, and that is building out your team early and, uh, and building out your product plan and the, and, and, and the importance of those two. And I wanna couch these two topics in terms of who, what, and why. But first a bit about my company. We are a preclinical stage oncology therapeutics discovery and development company. 
We are founded based on technology coming out of the University of Arizona. We're headquartered in Tucson. And for our very first uh, oncology medicine, we are, we are doing IND enabling studies so we can uh, um, uh, hopefully dose that first human patient in the not too distant, few, in the not too distant few future. Uh, Dr. Dibb said it all here. It's all, in the tran tra it's all in the translation. It's how you get from technology to product. I bring this up because uh, if you're thinking about your own startup, often we get technology and product confused. And I, I can tell you that I suffered from that as well. I know whenever I first pitched my company, and many of you here heard me pitch my company at the outset, I would talk about the technology and not much about the product. Unless you're selling a product, you don't really have a pro product yet. You either have a technology or at best, you have a product that's in development. It sounds incredibly obvious, but I can tell you it can be a hard concept to get your head around that you need to create that pro product plan. And this is about triumphs and failures. I can say that's one that I struggled with from the outset, but I want us to all understand, and, and Dr. Dib, you did a great job here talking about that, trend, that transition from technology into product. Well, on to team. You really need to build your team early. Uh, it, and, and I'll use my own example here just to, just to highlight the uh, point. So I felt like I studied for years before I became a startup, C, a startup, C, startup CEO. I have a PhD in chemistry. I went back to school, got an MBA in pharmaceutical, man, in, in pharmaceutical management. I worked for 25 years for big name pharmaceutical companies, Sanofi, GlaxoSmithKline. I worked at the bench. I was a lab manager. I was an R&D operations manager. Um, I joined an angel investing group, Tucson's Desert Angel, so I could learn about the investing game and how you sell a company. Uh, volunteered with some of my friends back there at Tech Launch Arizona as a commercialization partner, so I could see new technologies as they come out of the U university. And then one magic day, had a technology that I fell in love with and started a company. And I can tell you, not building out that team early, thinking I had it covered because I'd done all that stuff prior, that, that was a mistake. That was an absolute mistake. Why? Business creation is complex. You cannot have it all yourself in your own head. And the reason why you build out that team early is to enable quality decisions. Because the decisions you make at the outset can be, if they're bad decisions, can be fatal for, for your company. Or if, they're, or if they're not fatal, they can take years to un, unravel. And I see some heads nodding. I suspect some of you have seen, seen this. And so you build out your team early to illuminate those blind spots that, that you have so that you can make better decisions as a founder in your, your company. The main thing you want that team to do for you, the what, is to assess the technology to product gap. Really, how far away from you from actually having a product? Um, and I want to be clear, and we're, we're here on an academic, on an academic cam campus, that the academic research that was done to, um, uh, uh, to validate the technology is not the same as what you're going to do to build a uh, product. And so, uh, you know, the, the uh, incentives are different, the goals are different, and so just be clear on that there's going to be gaps there. And you need a team to help you identify what those gaps are so you know how far it is from A to B. Um, when your team assesses these gaps, what it's going to look like for, to go from technology to product, you'll be able to chart those value inflection points in, in your company, those milestones that you are going to need to hit as you build, as you build your company. You'll understand the time that, 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 that you think it's going to take, as well as the cost. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you on the front end determine, should I even start this business or are, are we so far away from a a um, uh, product that I should go looking for a different technology. Now the who, and I'm gonna insult some of my friends here in, in the room, I, I suppose, I didn't mean to, I didn't, I didn't know you guys were gonna be here. Anyway, um, you, you want people who are independent of you starting a company, who have no vested interest in seeing you start a, 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 a company. So, you know, you wanna get out of the, uh, the echo chamber. Your licensing manager, your tech transfer head, everybody's going to tell you how great the technology is and how this is just something you really ought to take, take on. But you, 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 you want to get away from people who are telling you that you're right 
and get the people that tell you the truth. Um, I can tell you one of the most important talent ads on my team didn't come on at the start, but came on about a year, year later. And my charge to her was rip the biology apart. Tell me what's right here. Tell me what's, what's, what's not. And it was only at that point that we started making progress as a company. You want to identify people that have done it before. And it means develop a product in a startup company or in any company for that matter, but people who know about product D, D, product D, D, product development. The greatest fear that I had to building a team early was that cost. Cause I didn't have any money. I'm not independently um, uh, wealthy. And I can tell you, as soon as you say you're going to start up a company, the $300 per hour mercenaries start showing up who are going to tell you that they can help you build your company and build it the right, right way. Don't hire those people. Um, I hired some high dollar consultants. I didn't hire them for that many hours, but the people who provided the most value were the ones who cost me the least cash up front. And so, like I said, the mercenaries are going to show up. They're going to have great stories, but be very wary of who you add to your team and what their motivations are. Talking about product, framing that product plan, what that looks like. Three big questions that you have to answer. What are you selling? You need to frame your product in specific terms. What business problem, what problem are you solving for a potential customer? Where are the pain pain points? You talked about experience, you know, and what what and what the experiences are of people and, and how that converts into a product. It's the very same thing. It helps you frame what it is. You know, again, it's not your technology. It's, it's the product which comes out of that technology. What exactly are you selling? Next question, who will buy it? What are you selling? Who will buy it? You've got to know who your customer is. You know, we, um, um, uh, you know, healthcare is a messed up business. We all, we all get into this thing because we think, be, be, because we care, care about patients. But it's not that often that the patient's actually making the decision here about what to buy. It's the medical doctor. It can be the payer. Uh, in, in my case, with a therapeutics company, we're marketing to pharmaceutical companies that we want to license our um, uh, product. But you got to know who your real customer is. And often it's not the patient. It's somebody else uh, uh, in that payer queue. That's who you have to be able to convince to buy your product. And then the last question, why would they buy it from you? What makes you any better? What, what you, know, um, you know, the hardest thing to do here as well, the hardest thing to overcome is standard of care. And so in, in this business, medical practitioners, healthcare, pra he health, healthcare practitioners, they've got tried and true methods that they've used for years. Why is your, why is your product so special that standard of care, that practice, medical practice should change? You've got to be able to address that question and you want to do it on the, um, uh, and, and you want to be able to do it on the front, on the front, front end. Maybe you are, are planning a business that has a recurring sales model where you need the same customers to buy from you over and over and over again. Why would they buy from, why would they buy from you again and again? Um, you may have, you may be onto a problem that a lot of people have recognized and are developing their own solutions. What makes your solution any better than anybody else's? You've got to know what that competitive landscape looks like. These are things that you want to know on the front end. I mean, I'm, 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 I can't be more, more clear here because these are things that help you understand should you even go forward. And if you do go forward, go forward with a reasonable business plan. Last thing I want to talk about is the who, what, and why of making it fun. This is a picture of my team. We have our own office now. We feel like we 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 feel like we we have arrived just a bit. But if you're thinking about starting a company, it can be the ride of your life. I worked for big companies for my whole career until this one, and I can tell you, my saying now is, I'll never hold a real job again. This is what I want to do. It is a lot of fun, and it's because of these people that uh, it's so much fun. We are mission driven. We think we have something that can be very special for cancer patients and we're driving it to the clinic as hard as we can. And so it is just a joy every day of the week. So um, with that, I just wanna close, build your team early, develop your product concept.
early. And if there's any time left, I'll take I'll take take some questions. I see we're a little bit late. If you want me to sit, that's fine too. Okay, one. If there's anybody who wants to ask anything or tell me I'm full, I'm full of crap or whatever, that's fine. Are you working on one product at a time or simultaneously multiple products at the same? Okay, the question is, are we working on one product at a time or multiple products? We are working on one because we have a technology platform, a platform, I have to say it again, a platform technology. And so we have to prove that that platform technology is capable of uh, delivering a product. And so we have one lead product that we are driving as hard as we can. We've got other ideas in the background, but no one's going to invest in us unless we are able to show that this platform technology is able to deliver on the promise. Uh, the, the people who have invested in, in our company, the, the really great board that we have assembled, they're beating me up every day about focus, focus, focus. You got to push that one compound. I think once you actually prove your concept works, you get a little more lat latitude there and you can start to work on other things. But for us, it's driving that lead product as hard as we can into the clinic. Thank you. One, one, one. Do you have investors in your company? Yes, sir. Yeah. So when they ask you what's your exit strategy, what's your answer? Um, well, uh, your exit strategy is going to be unique to your sector. We are, um, and, and I'll, I'll give you our specific answer and I'll do it quickly. Um, in oncology therapeutics, um, it's surprising. You know, we, we typically think about startups mostly exiting by M&A activity. In oncology therapeutics, half of the oncology therapeutics company that exit actually do so by, I, by, I, I, by IPO. They either do so in late preclinical development or after proof of concept in phase one. But it's, 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 it's a, diff it's a di different game here. But you know, if you're developing an exit strategy or anyone here is developing an a exit strategy, I can tell you whenever I started, Desert Angel, Every, the lore is is that it, everybody exits by M by M by M and A, but you go pull data like from a pitch book or someplace like that, and you see that companies like ours, half the time they exit by some other path. And so, um, yeah, you, you you have to do you have to do the study. I, I think our sector is a little bit weird in that I, IPOs are. Uh, so um, I, I wouldn't say readily available. Uh, otherwise, I would have already done one. But you know, but 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 that's 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 the uh, path. Absolutely. Well, I don't know. You know, because then you become a pub public company, and then you've got a whole other problem. So when I started my company, that's the advice I received was whenever you can raise cash, take it. Take it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You want to back? All right. Thank you so much. Sure. <laughs> and after our programming today, we want to invite you. We're going to be having a social networking event outside again. So our presenters will be there. So I invite you to stay and enjoy the networking and have the opportunity to get to know them a little bit more. So now I am honored to share another, our third organization spotlight. I would please welcome Jasmine Bahati, who is the co-founder of Navi Nurses. Thank you. That last presentation was fantastic, by the way. Great advice. Um, as you can see, my name is Jasmine Bahati, and I'm a registered nurse. So I've spent the last 10 years working in the hospital and just learning and navigating the startup world. Um, so very, very timely information, and thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm so proud to say that since January, my, my co-founder, Ayan, and I have built a company from just two nurses to 100. We've provided almost 7,000 hours of patient care, and all we're doing is providing personalized, on-demand, cl clinically expert care in homes for people. They're desperately seeking other options that actually meet their needs. And we're able to do that. And it's so exciting. <laughs> Building Navi for me is very personal. Long before I was a nurse, when I was actually a student at UVA in Tucson, my grandmother's cancer came back. And I learned firsthand what it meant to be a family caregiver. 
without having any medical knowledge, my family and I decided we weren't gonna put her in a nursing home. That was like against what we believed in. And we divided up the care. I lost sleep. I missed classes. I failed classes. Didn't see my friends. Every single person in my family, our lives were just disrupted. And it was really hard. She had advanced head and neck cancer. So there are a few times that I had to call 911 and the, and the ambulance, the EMTs would look at me and say, you know more managing this than I do. So you have to ride with us. <laughs> and being told that is really scary. You don't feel supported. And oftentimes we send people home. We don't really give them the means needed to take care of themselves at the time of discharge. And my story is not unique. So many people, they're scared when things happen and they don't wanna hurt their loved ones, but they end up sending them back into the hospital. And we go through this vicious cycle over and over again, which causes you know, hospitals to lose revenue. And then we have payer systems like Medicare and Medicaid, which lose billions of dollars every single year just because people are getting readmitted. So when we first started Navi, our target market was the 17% of people who leave the hospitals who actually are told they need to go to a nursing home, but they now no longer want to. And we saw that really with COVID, people became so much more scared. They didn't want to send their loved one somewhere where they couldn't interact with them. And that loneliness was just so real. So what we're trying to do and what we are doing is helping people not only heal at home, but we're helping these aging adults who oftentimes have multiple comorbidities actually age in place under the watchful eye of one or two nurses who become their family nurses and then are able to communicate back with their primary medical team and all their specialists and their family and keep everyone really engaged. We want people to age at home. It makes a really big difference, quality of life, financially, and for the entire family, there's so fewer disruptions. So how exactly does this work? Right now we're using a commercial, commercially available off-the-shelf technology, but we're working on building our own. So we're a nursing platform um, that pairs the best nurse with the needs of the person. So we are essentially providing precision nursing care. That means if you have a loved one who's just left the hospital and they've had a stroke, they're going to have a neuro nurse or a nurse that specializes in strokes. Someone just had a heart attack, they're gonna have a cardiac nurse or a critical care nurse that actually cares for them. And it's actually available on demand. You know, recently because of caregiving shortages, nursing shortages, we had a client that waited nine days for home health to come out and see, come out and see this patient. She was bed bound. She had a pick line. She had so much going on in nine days is unacceptable to get the care that she needed. She would have ended up back in the hospital had we not been called in to help. And we're able to provide care the very same day, which is amazing. We also take into account factors that we know make a difference like language and cultural preferences. We want to provide people the opportunity to hire a nurse who look and talk like them and who understand them as people. And the high quality also comes from being able to staff, our, uh, staff these, um, these people with nurses who have multiple years of experience. They've created that gut intuition that knows when I need to do something. Uh, so that's, that's what we're able to do. And what's amazing is people hire us on and on, on average, um, we come into the home for 120 hours of care. People right now are paying cash for this. We're collecting data because health equity is really important to us. My co-founder and I are both minorities. And so health equity is something that um, is part of our guiding light, but um, we're able to come in and give peace of mind. People can use HSA funds, FSA funds, and we're able to come in and provide anything really directed by the person and their family, whether it's going through their medication changes, giving them an assessment of not only their physical status, but their environment, what's happening with them psychosocially, are they getting out and seeing friends, and then coordinating all their care. They have so many providers taking care of them, they're not always talking but we get to help talk for them. And what's really cool about this is the research that does exist shows that when we do have nurses that provide care coordination in the outpatient setting, it's actually so much more financially responsible 
for people than sending them to a nursing home and they have better quality of life and they have better outcomes. So we're doing this and it's fantastic. I wanna share with you quickly two stories to our clients. Anne was hired by us, by her daughter who lives in Boston. The names have been changed for HIPAA. Um, her mom had MS, was recently admitted to the hospital. And she said, my dad is sick. He can't take care of my mom, but they don't wanna to go to a nursing home. Can you please help them? So we came in and we came in and did bi-weekly checks, two hours each visit. We would check the vitals, provide the education and support that both Anne and her husband needed. And after every shift, we update the family. Hey, this is what we saw. This is what we recommend. Your mom's doing great. Your dad's doing fantastic. There was one day that our nurse actually was at the house and she had a seizure in the bathroom while she was there. Our nurse was able to correctly get that patient to the hospital that, that, that Anne had already established 